and we're going to get into the word. Matter of fact, go ahead and turn over to Acts 26. And while you're doing that, uh, Miss Susanna is going to be, Susanna, everybody say hi, Susanna. Hi, Susanna. She's going to be back there at the table and uh, you can sign up for the daily move. Uh, if you'd like to partner with our ministry, you can do that. You know, anything you want back there, you can get it with debit or credit or credit card, whatever. It takes 30 seconds. But we just put out a brand new book. It's called The Move. Been writing it for two years, but it's got a lifetime of stories and revelation and nuggets. And uh, it's not super spiritual. It's not religious. It's not traditional. It's just very simple. And, uh, but the centerpiece of the book let me explain to you, first of all, the title. It's called The Move from the Shallows into the Deep. And it's my mission in life. Everywhere I go, I'm trying to get people out of puddles and get them over into rivers. The first scripture you'll read in the book is Psalms, is, uh, Psalms 42, 7. Deep calls unto... My favorite scripture. Deep calls unto deep. And deep's calling to you. Every one of you have heard God's voice. And you know what God's saying to you? Come on a little deeper. Well, that's what this book's about. But it's got 222 little nuggets and moves in it that'll uh, get you going. All right, Pastor, pick a number between 1 and 100. 100. Oh, you want 100? Oh, you're just going to go straight to 100, huh? All right, there's 80. There's 100. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This one begins chapter 6. It says, Our Kingdom Assignment's the title. I don't believe in quantity of words. I believe in quality of words. Here it is. Jesus is the king and we are his kings in the earth. This means that we've been given a kingdom assignment which to reign in this earthly domain. We have also been given a kingdom anointing and have gained access to kingdom provision. Ultimately, this all means that we have a kingdom assignment. Your kingdom assignment is where moving deep takes you. That's number 100. And then out there, there's all these series. They're all displayed out there. There's 16 of them, and every one of those series is on this flash drive. Now, this flash drive is $99. I've got nine of them. And when you get this for your Mac, PC, car, every series we've ever done is on this, but you also get the book for free. And so they're out there. Here's Miss Susanna. I'll give this to you. And you remembered all that? And uh you, the books are signed and they'll bless you. Are you at Acts 26? God told us 2018, it's a year of vision. It's a year of vision. Come on, somebody say vision. vision. It's one of my favorite words, vision. Well, what does that mean? It, it, when I hear that word vision, my mind gets flooded with all these analogies and examples that I've collected over, over, over all the years and things that have happened in Laura and I's life. That vision, I mean, I need to write a book one day just, 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 just on vision. I, I, I love that word. The first thing that comes to my mind is a car, is a car. Um, when you sit in a car, that's a great example of how you should live your life. There's a reason the front windshield is big and the rear view mirror is small. Amen. If you want to get life right, you better spend your time staring through the front windshield, not staring through the rear view mirror. Because if you do that, you're going to wind up wrecking. Yeah. But see, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of believers, and I call them rear view, pe rear view mirror people. All they do is spend their time looking backwards. Yeah. They're defined by their memories. God don't want you defined by your memories. You learn from your memories, but you're defined not by where you've gone or where you've been, but where you're, where you're going. If you want to be a good driver, you've got to stare through that front windshield. If you want to get life right, you've got to live vision, not memories. Most people, when I begin to crank up a conversation with somebody, you know what they immediately begin to do? Tell me about their past. Tell me about their memories. Very few people you'll begin to talk to and they'll begin to tell you about where they're going instead of where they've been. It's time to live vision. It's time to live vision. It's time to talk about where we're going. And not just as a, as a person, as a family, as a business, as a church. It's time to talk about where we're going. Amen? I think about, uh, I think about Alexander the Great. Uh, you know, love, love history. And Alexander the Great was real smart. He, you know, they were, they were marching hundreds of thousands of troops towards India, conquering the then known world. But he had a regiment of troops and 
they would get up early in the morning before everybody else and they would go in, a, in the direction that they would be traveling that day and they would get out ahead of the army and they carried a large pole, had a flag on top of it. And they would, they would go to where they were told to go, stop, plant that pole in the ground. And the whole army knew somewhere in that direction there's a pole. And when we get to that pole, that's where we're going to camp. That's where the water is. That's where the food is. That's where, the, that's where we're going to rest. So what impact do you think that made on those soldiers? As they're marching, where's their head? Their head's up. And where are they looking? They're looking ahead. They're not looking where they've been. They're looking where they're going. And the, come on, they're... Right? Oh, oh, oh is, that, is, is that the pole? Is that the pole? No, man, ain't no pole. That's a bird. I thought that was a pole. I thought that was a pole. When they finally see the pole off in the distance, do they speed up or slow down? Speed up. Speed up. That's vision. That's how God wants us to live. Hey, what's your pole? 2018, what's your pole? What's the vision? What are you looking forward to? Financially, what's your pole? Physically, what's your pole? Family, what's your pole? Church, what's your pole? Ministry, what's your pole? Are you living front windshield or are you living rear view mirror? I think of the word. I mean, think about Abraham and Sarah, Genesis 12. Get out of Ur of the Chaldees and go unto a land that I will show you. Go into a land. They had a vision, didn't they? If they would have lived memories, we never would have known who Abraham and Sarah was. Amen. But they're not, they weren't defined by where they've been. They were defined by where they were going. They followed the vision. They followed the, I think of Jesus. From the time he was a little boy, Pastor Mark, he had a vision. There wasn't a day that he woke up that, that sometime during that day he didn't think about that vision. And you know what his vision was? His death, burial, resurrection and the fact that he would be seated at the right hand of the father he had a vision he had a vision what's our vision what's our vision come on I think of Acts 26 are you there in that chapter look at verse 19 verse 19 I'll just quote it's one of my favorite scriptures the Apostle Paul said, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. There it is. Yeah. Now, we just lost Dr. Billy Graham, didn't we? Yeah. That man was not disobedient unto his heavenly vision. 99 years old. Busted heaven wide open. At the end of his life, surrounded by his family and friends, Man, he could look them in the eye and say, I wasn't disobedient unto my heavenly vision. He was able to say the same thing Paul said. What about you? See, I believe you, you, you live life better when you begin with the end in mind. Those last moments of your life. You're surrounded by family. You got your, you got your kids around you. You got your grandchildren around you. Come on, you, you, you got people around you. What do you want those moments to be like? Do, do, do you want those moments defined by anger, bitterness, regret, woulda, shoulda, coulda? Uh, do, do you want to be sitting there around your family and, be, and, and say this, listen, son, learn from my mistakes. Don't do as I did, do as I say. I mean, is, is, is that it? I, I, I don't, that's not what I want my last moments to be like. I, I, I want to be able to look at my family and say, you know what? I wasn't disobedient unto my heavenly vision. And if, if, if I can do it. And then I want to say, and you know what? By the way, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. And I kept the faith. Do you want those words to be able to come out of your mouth that day? Doesn't matter how young you are. Doesn't matter how old you are. It's not too late. Right. Turn to somebody say, it's not, it's not too late. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Doesn't matter. I know the blood. Right. You don't know the mistakes I've made. I know the blood. Yeah, but I've hurt. Uh, I know the blood. God can etch a sketch you. You may know what etch a sketch is. Man, some of you, you got your etch a sketch is just a mess. But God can pick you up this morning and do this. 
Woo! Do over. <laughs> Heavenly vision. <laughs> Heavenly vision. All right? That's good. Heavenly vision. Well, do you think Paul would say something like that and not in that chapter tell us how to get there? No, it's, it's, he tells us in that chapter how, to, how, how we get there. I, I want to I wanna show you a couple of things. If you want to get to the end of your life and be able to say, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, look up at verse 2. He's standing in front of a king. His name was King Agrippa. Googling history, pretty, uh, he was a king. He was a king. And the first thing Paul says to him in verse 2 is he says, I think myself happy. Huh, isn't that interesting? He said, I think myself happy. If you want to have a great life, if you want to get life right, anybody here, would, would you like to get life right? And you want to get to the end of your life and be able to say, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. You got to get happy right. So what do you mean? A lot of believers, a lot of people are waiting to be happy. They live their life waiting to be happy. What do you mean? Well, when I get a job, I'll be happy. When I get married, I'll be happy. When I get healed, I'll be happy. When I get my husband straightened out, I'll be happy. When I get my wife straightened out, I'll be happy. When I get my crazy kids right, I'll be happy. When this happens, when that happens, when I get my own home one day, I'll be happy. Do you understand what you're doing when you're waiting to be happy? It's like you're writing down how to defeat you on a piece of paper and giving it to the devil. Hey, devil, if you want to keep me down, here's the strategy you need to defeat me. How stupid is that? Because if I'm the devil and I know you're not going to be happy until you get a new home, then I, what am I going to make sure of? You don't get a new home. <laughs> Happiness is a choice. Not a feeling based on your circumstances or storms or even victories. It's a choice. Easier said than done. You don't understand my... It's a choice. Come on. Even if, even if tomorrow you won the Powerball and you are all of a sudden worth $500 million, you better not be any happier than you are today. Now you can have joy. You know, when things happen, there's joy. You get married, you joy. When you have kids, joy. When things happen and goals and dreams and visions, there's joy. But don't confuse that with happiness. Laura and I have maxed out happy. We'll never be any happier than we are right now. I'm not any... Pastor Mark, you've known me for years. Have you ever seen me waver in my happiness? I'm the happiest evangelist you know. Said your life must be perfect. No, my life ain't perfect. My, my, my son burned down my kitchen last year. <laughs> we were out of the house for four months living in a VRBO and hotels. <laughs> I was happy. <laughs> Didn't have a lot of joy that day, but I was happy. <laughs> Happiness, it's, a, it's based on a revelation of who you are on the inside, not just what's going on on the outside. Yeah. How many of you are saved? Who, who's who, who, born again? Love Jesus? Jesus loves you? You gonna bust heaven wide open one day? What else you need to be happy about? Amen. What else you need to be happy about? It's a choice. It's not a feeling. Amen. I've maxed out happy. When you see me next year, I ain't gonna be no happier than I am right now. <laughs> now, are we believing God for things in the ministry? Sure we are. And when things happen, joy. But I'm not any happier. Here, ultimately, here's what happiness is. Happiness is your gratitude to the Father for what He's done for you through Jesus. Amen. Brother Phil, I wish there was just some way I could just let God know how much I appreciate all He's done for me. I'm telling you, I'd be dead if it wasn't for God. I'd be in a hospital if it wasn't for God. I, my life would be horrible if it wasn't for God. What can I do to just let God know how much I appreciate what He's done for me? I, I, got, you, I got an idea for you. Be happy. Why are you happy? Because you got a revelation. You're not going to get life right if you don't get happy right. 
And some of you, boy, y'all have struggled with that. Because you've spent your whole life waiting to be happy. And thinking it had something to do with your emotions. It don't. It's got everything to do with revelation. If you want to get to the end of your life and be able to say, I wasn't disobedient until the heavenly... Vi you got to get happy right. Paul got happy right. And if there was anybody who shouldn't have got happy right, it was him. Because if you take all your crud and put it together, it doesn't match the crud he went through. Anybody in here ever been a shipwreck three times? Anybody in here received 39 stripes five times? Anybody in here ever been beaten with rods? Anybody in here ever been stoned to death? Then hush. But yet at the end of his life, what did he say? I think myself... You got to get happy right. After he says this, Pastor Mark, what he does... I'm not going to read it all. You can read it this afternoon. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, right? He's got King Agrippa... He could have preached anything he wanted to preach. I mean, he had his whole repertoire ready to roll, right? But what did he preach? He shared his testimony. I preached on that scripture last week. He preached on his testimony. He shared his testimony. He said, I think myself happy. And boom, here, here comes his testimony. All believers have a salvation testimony. But most believers don't have anything past that. In other words, if you're saved, every one of you could get up here, whether you're a preacher or not, and you could say, when I was seven years old, when I was nine years old, when I was ten years old, I was here, I was there, this person was preaching, I was at a camp, I was in a church. For me, Calvary Baptist Church, Cuddling, Louisiana, Pastor Davis, still remember it like it was yesterday. I could get up and share easily my salvation testimony. But most people, most believers, pass their salvation testimony, all they have is a story. And don't confuse your story with your testimony. Everybody's got a story, but few people have a testimony. Because a testimony is not just what God brought you out of, but what God brings you into. Your testimony. How do I, brother, how do I know I've got a testimony? All the pain of the past is now replaced with wisdom. Most churches now, you know, back in the day, they used to do testimony services all the time. Pastors don't do it anymore. You know why? Because people get up and they're not, they don't have a testimony. They're telling their story and they still have all this pain. Yeah. And you said it yesterday. They begin telling what they think is their testimony when it's really a story. And by the time they're done, everybody's like, Ooh. <laughs> They're still wounded. And I love that quote. Come on. We've got a scar. It's not a wound. It's not a wound. It's a scar. You don't have a testimony until that wound becomes a scar. All the pain is gone. And now in its place, there's wisdom to help other people with. And by the way, your testimony is the greatest platform you have to lift up the name of Jesus. It's better than anything you'll ever teach. Your testimony. Your testimony. It's the greatest platform you have to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. And here's the last thing about your testimony. In your testimony is where you'll find your greatest love for God. Because see, when you truly understand what God brought you out of and what God brought you into, that's where your love for God comes from. But it's also, it's also where you find your love for people. Because see, if God brought you out of alcoholism and now you're clean, who are you going to love? You're going, to learn, you're going to love alcoholics. You're going, to, you're, you're going to love people who are going through what you went through. Man, I know people, I know people who do incredible work in prison ministry. You know what most of them have in common? They spend time in jail. And they have a love for God based upon what God did for them, but they also have a love for those people because they know what they're going through. But it's also something, it's also a place where you find something we don't talk about in the church. And it's one of my life's missions to raise up. In your testimony is where you find hate. Turn to everybody say, say hate. hate. We're not hating enough. 
You need to let hate define your life more. God's called us to hate. Now, He ain't called us to hate people. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Can't hate people. But I'm going to tell you something. If there's nothing you hate, you're probably not doing much to build the kingdom. Let me say it again. If you don't hate anything, you're probably not doing much to build the kingdom. Because see, the preacher that hates poverty preaches prosperity. The preacher that hates sin preaches holiness. The preacher that hates sickness and disease preaches healing. The preacher that hates unbelief and doubt preaches faith and wisdom. Amen. See, what you hate the most is what God's called you to correct. Amen. Can we hate the devil? Can we hate sin? Can, can we hate abuse? Can we hate divorce? Can we hate... Come on. Human trafficking? Can we hate addiction? What do you hate? You only find that in your testimony. Because here's the deal. What you hate is going to be different than what I hate. Don't try to hate what I hate. You hate what you hate. And I'll hate what I hate. And Pastor Mark will hate what he hates. And where do we find that hate? In our testimony. Where do you find your love for people in your testimony? Where do you find your ultimate love for God? Testimony. Come on. Hallelujah. Anybody got a quarter? I need a quarter. I need a quarter. Somebody got a quarter. You got one right here. She's got one. She's got one. She's got one. She's got one. You got to get happy right. Got to get your testimony right. You're not going to get life right if you don't have your happy right and your testimony right. You're not going to get to the end of your life and be able to say, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision unless you get happy right and you get your testimony right. But I want you to notice something. Paul, when he said, I was not disobedient, notice he didn't say, I was obedient. He didn't say, I was obedient, did he? What did he say? He said, I wasn't disobedient. You know, when I see stuff like that, I always say to myself, why? Why did he say disobedient instead of obedient? This is why I believe he said that. Because he wanted all of us to know that when it comes to life, at the end of your life, you're either going to be obedient or you're going to be... It's one or the other. But see, the, the church doesn't do that. This is, how, this is how the religion functions. This is how church functions. This is how believers function. Because you've got to understand, all of us, me included, we have this incredible ability to justify and minimize what we do. So this is how it goes. I'm either going to be obedient or... Well, God knows my heart. You see what I just did there? That's not what Paul said, was it? What did Paul say? Obedient or disobedient? But we say, obedient or... God knows my heart. Think about what you just said. Because guess what? He does know your heart. He knows your heart more than you know your heart. Or we say, obedient or... Somebody else will do it. Well, God will raise somebody else to do it. Because he understands my... No, it's not what Paul said. Paul said, obedient or... So why are you holding a quarter? If you're going to live vision, you've got to understand a quarter. Heads or tails. Two sides of a coin, right? Vision is two sides of a coin. On one side of the coin, there's the vision for your life. It's what God's called you to do. It's who God's called you to be. It's, it's this love for God that you're supposed to operate in. It's this love for people that you're supposed to operate in. It's this hatred. How can you truly love people if you don't hate what's trying to destroy people? It, it's, it's your calling. It's your anointing. It's your ministry. It's how God has called you to move the kingdom forward. Not like me. Most of you will never ever stand in a pulpit and preach the gospel. Uh, there's more kingdom assignments that have nothing to do with the pulpit than have something to do with the pulpit. But the bottom line is all of us are called to move the kingdom forward. How do I do that? It's in your testimony. Huh? 
It's in your testimony. There's the, the vision of the church. Move the kingdom forward. What's, God hadn't called this church to do everything else every other church is doing. This church has a kingdom assignment. Who God's called this church to be. What God's called this church to do. Where God's called this church to go. Come on. What this church loves. Who this church loves and what this church hates. There's your vision. Front windshield. Somebody say front windshield. Front windshield. But then there's the other side of the coin. And this is where we miss it. And I'm fixing to apologize to you. On behalf of the kingdom, I'm fixing to apologize to you for something. The other side of the coin is, let me go back. One side of the coin is your vision. The other side of the coin is helping people find their vision. 51, been in full-time ministry since 1990. We launched out and started traveling the world in 2003. But up until then, I'd been in ministry full-time 15 years. Been around some of the greatest men and women of God on the planet. Took them to lunch, went and picked them up from airports, drove them places, spent time with them. I've been around some folks, been around some folks, been around some great people. And all those years, I've only had three people, three people, three people. Three people sit me down and sincerely ask me, Hey, Philip, what is it you feel like God's called you to do? Three people. Now, I can't count how many people have sat me down and rattled on about what God's called them to do. Well, we're doing this and we're doing that and we're doing this and we're doing that and we're doing this and we're doing that and then we're called to do this and we're called to do that. And oh my gosh, we're doing this and we're doing that. And you're sitting there going, wow, yeah, really? Wow, man, that's good. Woo, man, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really? Man, man, that's good. Man, God is so good, man. And then you're like, I mean, know what I'm talking about? Am I being real? And then you're just going on and on and on about heads. Come on, their vision. And that's good. They got a vision, right? Right? But you would think at some point they would stop and go, now wait a minute, enough about me. Yeah. What is it God's called you? What about you? How many people, how many people have looked you in the eyes, sat you down in a quiet place and asked you, hey, what is it God's called you to do? Even if you don't know the answer to it you would have still appreciated the fact that they asked and they cared. I'm sorry. I'm sorry the church has missed that. I'm sorry that we've, people have been so consumed with what God's called them to do, they didn't care about anything God's called anybody else to do. 2018 is a year of vision. The only way this church gets to the end and, and is able to say we were not disobedient until the heavenly vision is the quarter. We got to live vision, but we got to help people step into their vision because part of the vision of the church is helping people step into their vision. Amen.